Hi, all. Hi, and welcome. Hi, Jane. Hi, Hi Sven. Andrea, hey. Joan, Claude, Diana. Hi, Nofar. Hey. Hello. So thank you very much, all. And we will start by asking for your patience for a few minutes, just to allow people to join us and, and me to press admit. So where, where are you joining us from? If you can just drop your location and maybe the link to your LinkedIn profile into the chat and say a quick hello, that would be awesome. Friendly faces today as, as usual. Oh, I see Romanians starting to join us. This is good. More people based in Luxembourg. Hi, Virginia, nice to have you with us today. Paul and Sorina, Barbara. This, this becomes more familiar by the event. This is a nice feeling. We have a very young hacking HR fan. <laughs> yes, that's my opinion as well. How are you, Barbara? Good to see you. Hey, I'm good. I'm good. And you? I'm good. I saw your yeah. uh, I saw your message. I will get back yeah. to you. Yeah, no worries. Not in a hurry. Yeah. So we have as well. Luxembourg, South Africa. We have Israel. We have Oradea, which is my hometown. Lovely, lovely town. So who else is joining us? We have UK. I see this is a, an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. People are joining in. Let's just give people two more minutes and then we will slowly, slowly ease into the topic. Um, a light intro into heavy lifting. Maybe to break the ice, everybody can write how many, how much degrees is in your place, in your city where you live, because at the moment it's quite freezing here in Belgium. <laughs> Minus 18 we had this morning in Luxembourg. I thought my iPhone was broken, but no, it was minus 18. Whoa. That's like minus 18. That, that's the correct it mathematical. Was Context. The iPhone was freezed. <laughs> yes. Crazy. Guys. Oh. But, uh, but it was a lovely day today, though, with uh, really sunny. It was good to see the sun for a, for a change, right? Mm. At least here in Luxembourg. I will also share my LinkedIn profile. Jane is the winner, I guess. <laughs> Jane, no need to be so nice. <laughs> yeah, tell me, I'm in mean, 24 degrees. That's yeah. Not, that's not no allowed. No need to be so nice, huh? Yeah. You could have said 24. Who said, who said 24 degrees? You should be oh. muted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She, she already did it voluntarily, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, it's 35 minutes past and uh, being slightly German on the timetable, 
let's mm. let's start. So, officially and formally, welcome everyone. It is a joy and and privilege to welcome you to yet another Hacking HR Luxembourg and Friends event. So, uh, my name today is Hacking HR, but in any other day is Minola Jacques. Um, I had the um, crazy idea and then I got other people on board to start the Luxembourg chapter for Hacking HR. Journalist by trade, change manager by accident and choice on most days. And today's topic is heavy lifting for 2021. Um, I am sharing the joy of co-facilitating this event with my fellow happy hacker, uh, Miguel Pinheiro, if we can just do the online uh, meeting, hello. Um, I will try to read uh, your introductions while also admitting people. So if you see my eyes going all over the place, it is just me trying to make sense of what I am seeing and something is not working. Just give me one moment and see if we can do this right. No, it's not working. Dave. So troubleshooting again. <laughs> I will admit people and then start the bios. So I will read the bios as I can find them easiest because for some reason the word document is not working. So first off, I got to find Mary. So we have here today with us Mary Gloaka from the UK. Mary is a talent and leadership development professional and an all around learning geek. Standing still is not an option for her and is boring. That's why Mary enjoys networking and collaborating with people from all over the world who like her get excited about solving complex problems. Mary is mostly in her element when delivering large scale L&D transformation projects, especially the ones focused on leveraging technologies to create better user experiences. Mary is a member of the Josh Bursin Big Reset project, working with global learning leaders to redefine strategic L&D transformation post coronavirus and what enabling learning in the flow of work really means to organizations. Mary mentors young people from underprivileged backgrounds to help improve accessibility to opportunities for them. Once upon a time, a wannabe paleontologist and interpreter loves laughing and has an unhealthy crush on Freddie Mercury. So don't let Freddie us stop nice. you now, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and show must go on with- We are the champions, let's do it. <laughs> And show must go on with Imran is next because I know how to get the bio easily. Imran stopped fixing people and started fixing environments 20 years ago and became an organization and performance specialist and expert in measuring performance. He enjoys busting the myths about human performance and feels leadership is only about being painfully kind every day with the small things done well consistently. His motto is be simple, think people. And when he is not training his dog, or most probably his dog training him, he's the founder of Kokoro, a company focused on advancing <laughs> team development with belonging, psychologically, psychological safety, and flow. So welcome, Imram. A joy having you with us. Now, Cora. Thank you for your patience with me. <laughs> no problem. Fixing up the technical problems. Technology is a wonderful mm. thing until it isn't. Cora wasn't always passionate about employment law. She actually used to loathe it. But practicing this area of law changed everything and change doesn't worry Cora. In fact, she happily embraces it once interrupting her eagle career to try to become a wedding planner. 
when she <laughs> discovered that many of the qualities that make a good wedding planner, like being passionate, detail-oriented, and organized, also make for an excellent lawyer, she knew what she really wanted to do and set about building her own law firm. Cora is a big believer in giving friends and colleagues a leg up if she can. She believes that is the right thing to do and reaps rewards for both parties. Given how her international law practice has gone from strength to strength, who can argue with her philosophy? She's also very excited about pastries from Oberweiss, but that's another story. Very much looking forward to having you back with us for the Oberweiss story, Cora. <laughs> we, just, we just need to fix a date. <laughs> and last but not least, we are very happy to welcome Laurent Pesch. I, I hope I pronounced this correctly. This is what he says about himself. I joined the public employment service after a brief time at the immigration directorate. Over the past 13 years, I had the chance to be part of the transformation from a former classic administration to a modern agency with a fast growing and performance oriented employers department, which I joined as deputy head. This department gave me the opportunity to not only facilitate job seekers getting a job, but also the mission to support employers in their recruitment, in reskilling or upskilling their employees or future employees, as well as joining their talent attraction ventures and helping them to retain these talents in Luxembourg. Thank you very much for joining us, Laurent. I'm sure that you will bring um, a very interesting perspective into this conversation. Once again, thank you all for your curiosity and generosity with your time and knowledge and experience. And um, let's kick it off with the first question. What are, in your opinion, the changes expected throughout 2021 qualifying as heavy lifting? And I will just prompt you from left to right as you appear on, on my screen and looking forward to hearing your input. So Laurent, what heavy lifting do you expect to see in 2021? Well, let's say I have a different point of view than most of you because I'm not in the business. So, but I, my business is to, to help people get back in their jobs or at least help employers find someone suitable for their positions. But uh, what we have as heavy lifting is really good. The, the major changes that we see on the labor market. So it's no longer about um, finding all those talents in once and uh, retaining them simply, but also uh, I think employers uh, realize that they have to, um, to invest in their employees. And that's something what is really important and what, it, what changed in the last one, one and a half year. So uh, they at least saw that the potential that they have in their companies is bigger than what they always thought about it, but they never gave them a chance to uh, develop themselves into a new position or new profiles or with new technologies. And in fact, during the crisis, what we saw is uh, everything what has been said before. So um, that changes, major changes will be done in the next two to three years. Well, in fact, they happened in three months. And <laughs> This is one of the major changes that we had uh, to uh, to develop into our our main strategy. In fact, uh, to do a jump forward to two or three years, and now see what it's it's getting on because the, the business is getting faster and faster. It's no longer about uh, two and a half three days meetings to get a deal done, but it's a thing about uh, my mess Facebook Messenger twenty minutes and things will be facilitated and done. So and these are the major things that we saw in, in, in our business, in fact, that everything gets much faster and we have to, to help people and companies to um, sometimes get up and speed up with the market uh, to guarantee that they're not losing, in fact, people and market participation, uh, because that will be the, the major topics for us. All these companies who, major, who maybe will yeah, not see the light again uh, this year because of the, the pandemic. And uh, those are the things that we are dealing with uh, instead of any major other topics in labor law. 
which will also influence the whole market, at least in Luxembourg. Thank you, Laurent. Mary, how do you see 2021? Well, very interesting to hear to, to, to Laurent talking about, generally speaking, the, the ongoing war on talent and the talent marketplace. And, you know, we have moved away, at least theoretically, a while ago from, you know, hiring and firing to, to, to hiring and then developing and helping people build meaningful careers in, in an organization. But, you know, still in many organizations out there, it's, it's quite early days. But, um, you know, from my perspective, being um, in the world of learning um, and having worked in global organizations for a number of years now, um, the hottest topic really at the moment, um, <clears throat> one of the hottest topics and key topics on my mind is skills management and uh, skills development, um, also validation and credentializing of skills. So. At the moment, there is a lot of conversations in the business world around looking at subject matter experts, recruitment data, behavioral assessments, and things like that for validating skills apart from just using technology like Workday, um, for example. Um, so the reskilling and upskilling of the workforce, you know, that that topic has been out there for many, many years, but with the pace of change in the in the technology landscape, there are, um, you know, the type of talent management tools and, and AI obviously comes into play in that space as well that are really kind of setting the pace at which organizations need to act. So just to give, I'm not lobbying for any particular technology. I'm actually, you know, in a position of, uh, having to be really careful with what I procure because the pace of change in that landscape is phenomenal. But just an example of a, you know, Fuel 50, for example, how it comes into the market and, and offers AI type um, solutions to help, you know, identify talent and develop skills and, and things like that in, in organizations. Um, and also for me, a big focus in, in my current role is around integrating the learning technologies in, an, in a global organization whereby the current environment is quite disjointed and there are multiple platforms and multiple libraries in place. And how do we really you know, bring that together? How do we create a single point of entry for people and something that uh, some of you who know me already would have heard me uh, say multiple times, how do we enable learning in the flow of your day-to-day -day rhythm, whereby you can um, seek for content that is relevant and timely and that solves your problem right here, right now, rather than having to go through courses or looking through vast numbers of libraries. And there are really exciting developments in that space. So one of the real big challenges um, is that, you know, A, to keep up with the pace of change, but B, also, on the other hand, not to chase the next shiny thing, because the pace of change in the technology landscape is so huge that, you know, just two weeks ago, Microsoft announced the launch of Viva, which, um, you know, moves more into the space of creating an integrated employee experience. Uh, then a, a day later, uh, a company called Precipio, who is um, owned by Skillsoft, one of the biggest content libraries out there in the world, announced that they are integrating with Microsoft Viva and really paying attention to what's going on, and but not chasing the next thing, but really first understanding what your business needs and what your people need and want, and then choosing the right solution. So these are really... The, the, the core topics that are on my mind at the moment and heavy lifting in that space, definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing them with, with us. Korai, I imagine uh, the domain of employment law um, is looking into doing some heavy lifting this yes, year. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Um, I mean, 2020 has been quite challenging for people and businesses alike. Mm -hmm. And um, there are from a legal perspective, some changes that are going to um, 
uh, that we are expecting, uh, which are going to have a great impact, I believe, in the relationship between employers and employees. Um, the, uh, the most obvious one is, of course, um, remote working, uh, becoming the new normal. Um, so currently Luxembourg uh, remote working um, works, uh, is based on a convention of 2006, which is quite old, um, and uh, which still deals with remote working as an exceptional way of working. Now, what happened was that um, during the COVID, uh, remote working became so um, popular with employees that uh, there was actually a petition that was launched, uh, which gathered um, more than 6,000 uh, signatures, I believe, mine included, <laughs> I have to admit, um, to make a, a remote working a no new normal way of working. And so um, social partners have, um, on October 2020, um, signed an agreement uh, to make um, flexible remote working, uh, a new, to, 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 to make a new framework for flexible remote working. Um, with this new agreement, uh, we are going to see some major innovation, um, which includes uh, the principle of equal treatment between those working on-site and off-site. Um, we are going to see um, that uh, the employers no longer will have the right to control the place uh, where the employees work from, which is uh, innovation, innovative. Um, there is going to be a distinction between occasional and re regular remote working, which is also new since uh, up, to, up until now, uh, remote working was always a, an exceptional way of working, as I said. Um, uh, what else are we going to see? Um, well, there's going to be provisions uh, regarding return uh, to the normal way of working, the, the usual way of working, uh, which is going to be, I believe, quite challenging for many companies and employees alike. Um, another important uh, legal change, probably, um, in my opinion, is the right to disconnect. Um, so, yes, we talked about this, Miguel, I think when I, I, I did this conference on the holidays, uh, there was recent case law on the fact that employees had the right to disconnect uh, during the holidays. And now with ha what happened during COVID, um, well, it has been decided that uh, during the first quarter of this year, um, the House of, Com well, the Chamber of Deputies, the House of Commons, whatever you call it, um, will address the new challenges um, caused by remote working with respect to the right to disconnect for employees. Uh, these are, in my opinion, um, some important legal um, changes that we are going to see that we are expecting in 2021. Thank you, Cora. So we have a few recurrent themes. We have upskilling, reskilling, repurposing. We have the LND strategy to enable all these shifts. Um, we have the legal challenges of new ways of working, whether that refers to remote or different types of work engagement with a company and the right to disconnect. Imran. How do you see 2021 from where you are looking at it? Okay, um, I've just wonderful things that have been said. Um, I just want to try if I mean, you summed it up so beautifully there, Minola. And um, one thing that I'm seeing um, through what everybody said, that's, you know, Laurent, Mary and Cora, is this whole idea of understanding what is native to the person doing the work. And then looking at the, con there's a couple, a couple of concepts which I keep feeling which are broken. And not until we get away from that, will we be able to see what heavy lifting we need to do. And I said, for me, it's about, heavy lifting for me is about prioritizing. You can only heavy lift um, if you've prioritized to lift one thing. If you're trying to lift everything, you're not heavy lifting. You're being a fool. Um, you'll break your back, you, you, you'll, you'll damage yourself. Um, so you gotta pick, you gotta work out what weight you wanna pick up. So what does that mean? For me, when I look at everything, when I look at what Cora is saying about where the organization needs to look between the relationship between the employee at home and the company, when Mary looks at whether it's um, how do you create skill matrices, how do you um, look at, well, how, you know, when the employee knows what's coming at them, a new job, a new role, a new task, and they know what's going what, what's to happen, um, that they need to have more skills or they need to get themselves into this position of saying, I, I need more. 
And then Laurent, um, who needs to provide these people as fast as possible. <laughs> and also think even further ahead, what roles are gonna be there in three years? I mean, you, you, you gotta be a soothsayer to be able to work that one out. The only thing I see is that the heaviest thing you've got to lift is automation. <laughs> it's automation, ultimately, is I want to have, um, you know, we talk about global citizens. Well, I think we need to have data citizens in organizations, people who know, to, who know how to read data in living systems, and we don't have um, the standard leader can't read good data well. Um, they read them like a car dashboard. Um, it's working, it's not working. No, you don't read data like that with complex systems. And what I keep realizing is how do we automate this? How do we automate aspects of, say, let's let's pick um, a role. You are now put in charge of a transformation. You've been talking about change, Manola, you're a change manager yourself. Now, what part could I automate of your role that will just help you and avoid you from writing 20, 30 emails to maybe 40 managers around the world who have to take care of the change process. How could you automate that part? Because that would take a lot off your back. And most probably the emails you send out are about listening, listening to them, what's their problems, how can I help? Where is the signal coming on? I need to find out the signal that I need to respond to. And you have to react with the system. It's just too slow. It's just far too slow. So. What data do you need coming in that needs to be automated that gives you, ah, in all this noise, this is the signal I need to work on. And then you know where to put your resources, you know where you, then I'm coming to you as HR and I'm getting to know you even better in your role. And that's what we're not doing. Um, and one of the things, this is actually a criticism on all of us, and me included, I wanna get back into the office and see people. Um, did we really value those talks at the water cooler as much as actually grabbing a sandwich, going back to the table at work. I think my son's, that's a protein drink, I think, being made somewhere in the background. Sorry about that. <laughs> God, that's a loud machine. So I'll speak a bit louder. <laughs> Are we really valuing those people's, um, those, those conversations um, that really happened? Um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm like thinking, yeah, that's why we've got this. Uh, um, that's why what I like what you said, Cora, about the law is always a place where I always go to to see how is the culture moving and shifting in a country. And it's so true in some of the things you say, the, the, the world is realizing we have bought the offices home and it's not working. And now how do we move things? But we need data for that. We need to listen to the people and be able to change. So for me, the biggest thing is automation. Automating it in, how do we automate HR? And how do we get HR to listen better and stop talking about people and start talking with people? I think it was a good reminder with, with the noise we had in the background that there is also a lot of noise within organizations and a lot of noise around our conversations. And that also um, sometimes blurs, speaking about prioritization also blurs our perception of urgent versus important. So- I agree completely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mary, you are going to say something, I think. Well, <laughs> no, I'm just, you know, I'm just listening to everyone, you know, sharing their thoughts. And I'm sure there are lots of thoughts from, from my friends who joined today as well. But maybe just one thing that, you know, a, a quick reaction to what Imran was saying, um, because some trauma is coming back. <laughs> no, but I think it's really important, not just now, but it always has been, but even more so now, that any and every professional looks themselves in the mirror and and challenges themselves as well um and i am you know i've been working in the world of of talent and learning and development for, for some time now and probably have been preaching some unpopular things but you know we absolutely have a duty you know to to constantly develop ourselves. You know, we're preaching this to other people um, and that's part of the heavy lifting, right? That to first and foremost realize and accept that it's learning is not a finite process. It's just life. <laughs> Everything that you do, even you know, this conversation today, we're all learning, right? Um, but, you know, just something to add that I'm very passionate about from my perspective. And I think that's something that the world of, uh, you know, L&D professionals is, is kind of, you know, moving towards more and more, but I'd like to see a faster, 
case in, of that happening, that we become these internal consultants and collaborators and we talk to analytics teams, we talk to IT, we talk to marketing, we talk to creative design, we talk to product design, we talk to our vendors. We, you know, I hear so much, you know, the easiest thing, for example, is to blame your vendor for something not going right. And I challenge that because, you know, you know. What is really the, the, the meaning of true partnership? Is it that you see your vendor as your executor of your will, or uh, do you see your vendor as a, you know, um, a, a team of particular capabilities that you hired, so they provide that expertise to you and you are open to being challenged and you are collaborating with them. And you are, as I sometimes say to, to my teams, you are the window to the organization for your vendor. I'm not saying to disclose uh, confidential information, but in the end of the day, if you don't say how it is to your vendor, then they will be wandering in the dark. So that's just a, just an example of what I what really resonated with me. What Imran said, instead of in terms of challenging, every professional should be challenging themselves all the time. And that's also part of the heavy lifting. But, you know, if you feel the stretch, that, that's good. <laughs> um, can I jump in? No, Minola. Yes, yes. It's good to have you back. Ah, thanks. So I was having <laughs> issues with my connection. So I was hearing all of you together. And um, it, it's very good that we're departing from now to the future, right? But I also think that... 2020 has been a year that's been lived differently for people from different aspects and backgrounds and also from different geographies. So before going forward into the future, I would also like to ask you, what do you believe have been the most important consequences of the pandemic in terms of heavy lifting? Of, of course, from your point of view, how did we get here? And we can go as you guys prefer. Yeah, um, yeah, may I just add something? Um, because Imran said something um, that very struck a chord. He, he talked about valuing people. Um, and I think mm. that's very important. Um, I think that one of the, um, one of the things that might change uh, after everything that happened is the, the way management, the current management system works. I think that the COVID period, the pandemic, um, can be seen as an opportunity to um, to change that management um, system. Why is that? I, um, I feel like many, many people are uh, in no rush to get back to work, like physically mm -hmm. go back to their working place. Um, and from what I've seen, uh, some HR people are quite surprised um, because it's like they felt that, you know, they were doing their best and um, giving great opportunities, giving uh, pleasant working conditions. Um, and some of them might not understand why people don't want to get back to the working place. Um, I think that this is um, something that should be, um, that those HR people, all us uh, together should think about, because I think that um, the input that managers managers have to have to bring is really important here. Um, I think that they have to value people both individually and as a group because the group is not just like the weekly group meeting. The group itself has to have um, a real function uh, okay. so that people know that they are coming back to work with their group. They have a mission. Also, they have to be valued individually. They have to feel like... Um, they have a mission. They are the only ones to do that task or that job. And this is why they are wanted. Um, and this makes them feel more involved, I believe. And if you feel involved, then you are eager to get back to your work. Mm. Um, so I think that, yes, valuing people is important, as well as um, sharing information. We are still in, um, in positions where at the management um, the managers uh, in general uh, retain certain informations because they feel like if they give away too much, um, people who are below them um, 
will try to surpass them, uh, which is mm. not the case. I think that um, employees should have autonomy to evaluate themselves, but if they want to do that, they have to have access to the information. So valuing people, I think, is very important and will help um, people get back to the, the workplace. Otherwise, we are going to have some very challenging times, I guess. Okay. So, Cora, basically, one of the consequences could be the re-questioning of how to yeah. make appealing the workplace for employees yes. and also the possibility of employees of questioning themselves the sense of belonging. Yes. Imran? You, you, I think it would be also really nice to hear from your point of view. What do you think has been one of the consequences of, yes, of, of the pandemic in terms of heavy lifting? Yeah, good, because there's a lot of topics you've touched there now. So let me start. Yeah, with, um, yeah. Let's get real about how do you actually make this happen. So Cora, you said about um, information, um, you know, autonomy, um, signal. Um, how that really begins is um, you can only get signal if three things happen. Um, if you're able to see where... Um, if, how you acquire information, how you assess it, and how you redistribute it. If that's not happening, then you have no agility in your organization. If you have no agility in your organization, that means there's no learning. If there's no learning, your place is not psychologically safe. So the minute you keep information, you're making your place psychologically unsafe and unfit for your people to work. Now, that is, there is a law for that at the European level, and it's going to come and hit us this year. It's the ISO 10075. That is what they call the psychological strain you put your people under. And companies will be fine from next year onwards. So there's an EU directive I really like, and I'm happy it's coming. If you haven't checked it out, it's gonna hit you and you've got to work this one out. And it starts with, are your structures allowing information to flow? That's one part, that's psychological safety. Now let's get to belonging. Belonging is one of those wonderful things, isn't it? Um, this, this great, great, great word, cultural fit. If you don't, if you don't fit in, fuck off. <laughs> That's what you do. Um, I'm tired of these colonial structures. I'm not about cultural fit. Laurent, I think you always look for cultural ad, don't you, when you hire people? When you're, a company wants to hire people, it should be about cultural ad. It's like, I don't want to hire the same person. I want to hire somebody new who brings in new thought, new waves of, new waves or whatever, whether it's a ripple effect or whether it's new thinking, it's about cultural ad. Every Immigrant kid born in Europe is a cultural ad. I don't want them to fit into Europe structures. I want us to grow as Europe. So you got the thing around belonging. That means that belonging is a two-way thing. Belonging is not your job to fit in, but it's the team of the organization's job because they are bigger. They have more responsibility to create the model of belonging so other people can embrace it. And I think organizations forget that. Now, another thing, people think resilience is something which is... Um, it's your job to find your resilience. Do your meditation, do your yoga, eat well, become a vegan, do everything right. Um, no, resilience only happens at a group level. If the group is only banging away about work-life balance, which was a hierarchical solution to people, you know, this is when top leadership 20 years ago said, what do we give people because our culture is shirts? So shit, a oh, work-life balance. <laughs> so to make people more resilient to tolerate a shit culture, we still got, now we've got even higher levels of burnout and disengagement, fantastic. Then what we got was the engagement survey. So when people are, what, what are we measuring when people are engaged? Disengagement or engagement? No, we're measuring disengagement. It's already too late. So my question really is Miguel, um, to get belonging, um, it's about training our leaders and organizations to be able to, to actually create, um, to actually model it. And they're not modeling it at all at the moment. Mm. And um, 50% aren't. And I'll, tell, I'll give you one simple reason why they're not doing it, because top leadership has not stopped and changed at all in 20, 2020. They're doing the same thing they've always done. Mm -hmm. They haven't stopped. Mm -hmm. about what's changing. I, I, I seem to recover from everything that you're saying, more or less the lines of what Cora was trying to say, that the con one of the consequences has been that we have been put over the table in the need of re-questioning how are we making people engage into the job board? Is there job security, job certainty? One. How is that engagement? And well, the I would thing. also like to hear Mary on this, because Mary, you said that you've been speaking um, 
you talked about large organizations in which you were uh, you have to face give a face to the new to the insertion of new technologies right so i think there's this problem of new technologies and the uncertainty in people there's actually even phenomena attached to the technological stress and this is present i mean in 2020 we had a smack of it like you need to get in front of your computer you need to work from home what about it what is the consequence of this uh, heavy lifting from 2020 the pandemic yeah, again, I I think Laurent, uh, sorry, I think Imran, you're growing a little fan here in me because I, I really love what you're saying and it really resonates. And I must be really honest with, with everyone here that, uh, and this is what Manola said in my bio, that when it's easy, I'm kind of not interested. That's why I, I've been working in some of the toughest environments for this type of conversations, to be honest, from a culture point of view as well. I sadly, I need to agree with Imran that um, leadership, senior leadership has uh, still quite a long way to go. Um, so part of the reason why I am very involved in developing, helping young people develop leadership skills, because I do feel that sometimes for some people it's just too late to know. If you've got 20 or 30 years of bad experience and bad behavior, then I'm not saying that cannot change. I'm saying that that change can come just too late. You've already burned half of your organization along the way. Um, and unfortunately, one or two very toxic people can have a huge impact if they are in, 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 in decision making roles. So, um, so I think, you know, part of the heavy lifting in that sense is paying more attention and interest to young people um, to kind of, you know, develop the, the mindset really that is needed. If someone wants to build a career in the corporate world, that's absolutely fine. But you know what, it's not gonna work anymore like it used to through command and control um, because then no one is gonna work, want to work for you or you're gonna have a very, very unhealthy workforce in the end of the day. Um, so, you know, these are, these are really complex topics because, because I think, again, it just boils down to, you know, whether some people are prepared for the change or not. And we've got some change management experts in the crowd. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at our hacking HR <laughs> facilitator being one of them, and I'm sure there are others in, in, the, in the ground. And, you know, for me, again, technology, process, these are all really important things. But in the end of the day, you know, don't get me wrong, I don't have a PhD in this, but once you've been around the block a little bit, these things are just mm. obvious. But in the end of the day, it's down to the people, um, whether those people understand the process, understand the technology, want to work with it, want to do a good job you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And that that spans across all of the layers in in the organization. And if and and that piece of engaging with the toughest crowd and trying to, you know, um, not so much win them over because it's not about your personal opinion in the end of the day. You're doing it for the organization. If you're doing it just for yourself, then and that's a separate topic that we might cover in a different chapter of fucking HR. But um, you've got to be there. And, you know, I, I spend most of my day every day talking to people, trying to understand their motivations, trying to understand what triggers them, what they, they like to hear, what they don't like to hear, and really understanding how to get through to them that, you know, this organic any organization is, you know, is not your personal playing field. Um, but you ended up in a senior position and it's your duty to, to look after your people first and foremost. For me, the ultimate uh, um, trait of a good leader is selflessness. If you do, I mean, there are so many skills we can talk about, right? I mean, we all need lots of skills all the time and you will see, you know, LinkedIn booming with, you know, top 10 leadership skills, top five skills, you know, that make a great leader. 
I completely get that. And, you know, I am in this business. So, so, so partially there are some things that I obviously believe in and, and, and that resonate with me as well. But, but I think selflessness is not something that can be taught or trained. It's an attitude. It's how you perceive the world and how you perceive the other person. And that goes back to then how do you create that psychological safety in your organization? And man, it's really hard, you know, because you've got to listen with intent and you've got to pay attention to, to what people tell you, but you've got to put the hard work in there, you know, otherwise you might as well just not bother to be honest, because if people are not on board with the change that needs to happen, then, then it just, it just doesn't matter <laughs> in the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then to fit, to end, uh, Laurent, what is your point of view? What do you think have been the important consequences of the pandemic? So a very awaited question is unemployment going up down the scaling of new people going up down. How's the market mobility? What do you have to add on what the guys have been talking about? Well, I think they, they already explained much of the, of the problems that we that we had in the last uh, 12 months. Um, I think that lots of managers, companies, or even in departments, or even uh, into, you know, into our business and into our um, administration, one of the major topics was trust your people. Because remote work always was seen as Somebody's at home, he's looking at TV shows, he's doing some stuff with their kids, and, uh, but he's not working. And in fact, this was one of, the, one of the major topics, I think, to see that people, even if they are at home at remote work, that they work. Maybe they work much more than if they are at the office um, and they don't respect, let's say, positively their working hours, their proper working hours. They are working in the evening, they are working in the morning when they can't sleep. They are starting, I don't know at what time. And so that's always, the manager not always has to, to push them to the limits, but also to tell them, okay, this is the limit, you have to stop once. Because it's, uh, it, it isn't good for your, for your healthy if for, to stay healthy if you stay at the office for 12 or 14 hours, but it's the same at home. And this is one of the things that we had to also to explain to some companies that you have to trust people. Uh, even if we know that in the beginning it was an, a major impact due to, uh, as all the cross border workers in Luxembourg, they don't have the right to stay at home for uh, an undetermined period of time. There was there were some limits, uh, even if the government negotiated with those other governments to um, uh, to extend these uh, periods now till mid of uh, 21. But afterwards, this will be one of the major topics in Luxembourg. We can't establish the best ever remote work law that exists on the planet if the other countries around us are not playing the same game. They will say, okay, for Germany, you have 20 days that you are allowed to do remote work if you're working in Luxembourg, not more. Well then you can stop everything because then it will be an, uh, an issue that those who are living in Luxembourg can stay at home even every week for two, three or four days or even five days or whatever. But those who are cross-border workers, and let's say we have more than 200,000 cross-border workers each day. So all these have to come to the offices. Uh, again, the, all the traffic uh, will be stuck everywhere. And this, these are topics for Luxembourg, but these are also, well, we also have cultural things in there because uh, we have around 80 different nationalities in Luxembourg. Um, so at least 73% of the working market with people who are working in Luxembourg are non-Luxembourgish citizens. So they don't have yeah. Luxembourgish residentship. And, and this makes a, a huge difference for Luxembourg. And that's something we see. We see the different cultural aspects. So those who are working in the construction field who are coming lots from Portugal, Italy, or even now from, uh, from states from Balkan. But you see, they don't want to stop and if they have to stop, as it was locked down from the government, well, they returned home. They returned to their countries. Then mm. it started for employers. Well, now I can't start again working, but I have no employees in Luxembourg. What can I do? 
So they told us, okay, can you provide us uh, with 500 uh, people from the construction side? We said, um, no, <laughs> we don't have them. <laughs> Where will we find them? So th these are things. And I think uh, what we saw already about uh, the, the new vacancies that we see from the, the different business sectors is that, uh, for one, craft is exploding because people stay at home during 12 months. They didn't go on holidays, so they have money to spend mm -hmm. in the country. So this is one aspect. But the other aspect is still that all those uh, sectors that were growing before are still growing and even faster because uh, everything what we spoke about two years ago about future of work, well, we are in it. And even now they are getting new works and new profiles that they that are emerging from the, out of the blue, that nobody knows how to fill them. And, and these are the things that we are looking for. We, we really have to, to, to push ourselves to get on the front line. As our prime minister always says, we have to be in the first car uh, on, the, on the road. And well, that's not so easy always. As uh, you see for the moment, uh, all our problems that we have, well, uh, in the whole world with vaccination rate, uh, well, I think Luxembourg, we are small, but still we are the, one of the last ones <laughs> in, the, in the statistics. So uh, these, these are things that we are seeing, well, as I always say, from the opinion of the public employment service. I can see always how it is in a company, but we see that the companies are getting um, sometimes frustrated also by remote work because lots of sectors are living from the interaction between people and uh, even in my department i had some people who said okay i have to come to the office otherwise i will be getting separated from my wife <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and no, it's actually pretty pretty interesting what you say like we were always talking about the future of work and now that we're here it seems that a lot of people wants to go to the past of work <laughs> yeah for, for <laughs> Yeah, right. you, have a lot of, you have a lot of people who say, okay, it's going too fast for me. And yeah, also a lot yeah. of companies, uh, mm -hmm. beca because most, most of the market cannot uh, fix their problems in transformation or automation in uh, two or three months. They don't have the budget to do it. So this will take months and years until we we'll see uh, who will survive the crisis or the pandemic or who not. Can I say oh, something? we got Mary okay. around for that. I like to say something like, uh, like you know, like Laurent, you say for some people it's too fast. It's really, really interesting because you'll very, very often find they are white middle class people. And I've had enough of this because I've been waiting for 40 years, the generations before me, it's immigrant kids in Europe, when people tell us um, inclusion diversity is a complex matter, it takes time. And for the first time in the last 12 months, we've seen things move. Mm. And we're happy. We're okay with it. I'm texting back and, friend, back, and, back and forth with my black friends who um, are in professional position in the UK and are saying, finally, things are moving. People are actually talking about inclusion diversity has not worked and it has not worked for the groups it was meant to be. Um, Laurent, I asked the question, why have people, you know, you, you, you know people um, hire inclusion diversity people in these organizations and they don't do a good job. They're not doing the job they're supposed to do. Um, and it's always that saying, I'm sure most of you've seen it on Facebook, you know, inclusion, you get invited to the party, diversity is being asked to dance, but belonging, true belonging is you're allowed to dance how you want to dance. Mm -hmm. And every time you dance, mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to be a good leader, you get policed and shut down if you're too good. And that's what I'm talking about. So it's really, really interesting to not only see that some people are finding it too fast, but some people out there are just really happy that things are finally moving. For the first time, I've seen things move in Europe, which I haven't seen move in the last 30 40 years 30 for 35 years mm. in inclusion diversity and well, i think people are coming up to me it's an interesting topic to look at like how people yeah. are experiencing oh it's all too fast for me i need to get away from oh. my partner at home then get divorced <laughs> <laughs> then yeah. you're something in, in, wrong with in, your fucking relationship <laughs> get out of there imran but, since you're already talking about this i would like to jump exactly into this now that you're speaking about things have been changing and moving how have you been dealing with these topics during the current pandemic period? What have you, what have you done during the last year? Okay, so I- these issues of heavy lifting. 
Oh, well, I've done a few, and I've been creating a tool which I've been working on for over six years, um, which is about measuring flow, um, looking at the transom, listening to the people I've been coaching over the last 15, 16 years in 70 countries, about 10,000 hours, and realizing that nobody's providing them the data they need to sense people and listen to people quicker and faster. Um, so that's what I've been building. And I've gone absolutely, because of the year providing space for me, I've gone deep into the science and made the science practical so people can get things from me and say, okay, look, what's the first things a team need to do to get more resilient? Um, well, you've got to bulldoze your calendar. Make sure that you're, um, when you meet, you separate asynchronized work and synchronized work. And it's simple things that teams can do tomorrow and working out how that impacts flow, belonging, um, creating a psychological safety, getting leaders to stop and saying what structures need to change to create psychological safety. Because psychological safety still is a too scientific term. It means nothing. They all go, ah, safety. Yes, you won't lose your job. No, psychological safety is not about keeping your job or losing your job. It's about group trust. Okay, and, 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 and now that we all went a little bit on top of the of the situations that the year post put on top of us, what do you believe are the biggest opportunities to come? And this is a question for all the panel. Yeah, yeah, I've got one little thing. Yeah, I've got one, a simple, simple and I'll shut up. My thing is start creating performance systems that integrate well-being, mental well-being and everything. Get past your head that setting a goal at the beginning of the year and getting somebody to run towards it like an idiot is the way to create performance, no. Performance without well-being doesn't work. So create a structure and a process and a system that integrates both. Okay. Include performance measurements that include well-being. Cora, yeah. what do you shoot at us? You're muted, Cora. We cannot hear you. Sorry. There you go. Um, yes, no, I was, uh, I was thinking about what everybody was saying. Um, and I was just wanted to get back to something Laurent said, which was very, I mean, which in my situation we've seen quite a bit is uh, the problem with trust between employers and employees. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've been doing um, litigation in employment law for quite some time, but never have I seen like the relationship between employer and employee unfolding right in front of our eyes. We usually see it when it's ended in court. We've had a few cases or a few clients um, the past year. Um, the first one happened during, um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I think it was March or April, a uh, past client who came to us and he said that he had issues with his employer. Uh, so the problem was that this, um, th th this guy went on holiday right before the pandemic and uh, he went to Morocco. And uh, Morocco suddenly closed its borders without uh, talking too much about it because they didn't want everybody to run to rush to the airport. So he was basically, um, well, left there in uh, Morocco. And um, he stopped receiving his salary. Uh, so there was a lot of bickering between himself and the employer um, because they said that, well, he should have taken the opportunity to, to leave by every single mean that he had, but he didn't have any. And they refused to, to to, to pay him, but then the guy was left with no money at all and couldn't work, obviously, because he was working for a maritime company. We've had um, clients saying that, well, their managers were staying at home, but forcing them to go to work uh, in teams. And like two weeks after she caught COVID, she was sick for two months. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had people who we're not happy with going to work, even though, because at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, um, we didn't have a proper list of who was considered as a um, vulnerable person or who was not. So it was a bit uh, blurish. And um, we had some people who were working um, um, in, um, oh, you call it again, um, you know, cleaning, cleaning ladies, we've had cleaning ladies who didn't want to go to work because they didn't feel safe. Um, so they went to the doctor to get certificates and employers were not happy with it. And so, I mean, I have seen um, a lot of distru uh, distrust between employers and employees. 
and ha that has been really eye opening. So I don't know, um, and I'm talking to all of the HR professionals because my side, we, I mean, we come at the end of the relationship, what could be done um, to repair that trust? Because I think that it wasn't there before, but now it's like it's been blown to our faces and we really see it. Um, that's one of my questions to, to, to you guys. Um, in, in the opportunity moving forward from this, I mean, if there's, if there's has to be, is there a positive side from all of this? Well, the positive side, I'd say, um, I mean, for us, uh, we've never had that many immigration files. Um, I have had people um, get in touch with us from Canada, from US, from China, saying that they were in top management positions and um, working from home. And now that they see that everywhere in the world, uh, remote working is promoted, well, they come to us and say, well, okay, I've always wanted to discover Europe. I want to go to Europe. I want to come to Luxembourg. <laughs> and yes, truly, I want to come to Luxembourg, <laughs> live in Luxembourg, because I can keep working remotely from, from my firm uh, in Toronto or in Chicago. I had a call with a guy uh, from Chicago uh, who wanted to come discover Europe and Luxembourg and um, uh, come live here. So that's a great opportunity for us because we're immigration specialists as well as employment law specialists. So this has been great for us. Okay. Um, Laurent, what about you and, and, or Mary? Well, ladies first, let's start with Mary. Oh no, come on. Let's go with Laurent. I We're think, all equal I here. Will, <laughs> I think you have a lot to say in this point, Mary, because we'll, as well, as we in the beginning, <laughs> AI technology, uh, I feel like I'm, I might be sounding like a broken record, but again, what you guys have been saying is I can't, you know, I can't emphasize enough of mm -hmm. the duty that every professional has. It doesn't matter your role. It doesn't matter your industry you're in. Any organization, small, medium, large, you know, global, corporate enterprise, whatever, is an organism and it will only function well if all the parts are working in a symbiotic relationship. So, you know, something that I really sometimes don't understand is, you know, people who, who, you know, need to solve for very, very complex issues, don't bring in expertise to the table that they have to hand in the, in your organization. You've got, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of people, there is knowledge, there are skills, there is expertise that you should draw on and you should bring in people to the process when you're trying to solve for very, very complex issues. I mean, you know, just a simple example, for example, you know, I, one of, one of my focus areas, I mean, I moved to my current organization only a couple of months ago um, from a global investment bank where I was at for, for, for three years. Um, and, you know, I want to completely, you know, relook at how we, um, you know, at the whole learning analytics piece. And, you know, this is one of the most difficult things in the world of learning and development, you know, true return on investment. I hate that phrase, by the way, but you know, moving away from reporting on bums on seats and how many hours people spent in training. Well, so what? That only tells you that the, the million hours that your people spent in training, they didn't spend working for you. For example, right? I'm not mm -hmm. saying that that learning mm -hmm. wasn't mm -hmm. valuable, but that's not mm -hmm. a data point that proves that that learning was valuable. So now, but that's the challenge, right? I'm not able to solve this problem by myself. I need to talk to business leaders, I need to find some performance related data. Uh, I need to work with talent acquisition teams. You know, I need to work with other people around the business. And I need to first and foremost understand if that data even exists in the business. And if it doesn't, how do we solve for that, right? So again, on my own, I cannot possibly solve this problem. I have absolutely zero chance to do this. I can have the biggest aspiration, I can have the biggest drive, I can have all the, I can give it all my energy, 
and I will die at the end of it and I'm not going to solve this problem, you know. It's <laughs> the only way to do it is that I need to find the right people in the business mm. and they need to tell me what they know and I need to listen to them and I need to take that into consideration when I design learning analytics. I had a fantastic privilege and the more I think about it and reflect on it, it was an, an actual privilege because when I was in my previous organization, I worked with some of the best talent, people talent and people analytics professionals that I've ever come across in my life. Uh, very progressive forward thinking people. And, you know, I had the privilege of working with them in, in creating a data driven approach to identifying potential in the business, but not only potential, also helping the business understand, for example, you know, of the people that you deem as talent and again it's a separate you know conversation about what talent really means but we had our internal internal definitions that we created if i know from the different data points that i put into this that you know 10 percent of your particular departments sit in business critical roles but of those 10 percent of business critical roles in your department 50 percent are at flight risk for example then what is really the issue? Why are the, the why those people are so unhappy to the point that they are on very, very good salaries? I'm not saying everyone is driven by, by financial compensation, but I'm talking yeah. about an organization that, you know, typically have a lot of people who are motivated by money and banking, right? Why are these people so deeply unhappy that they want to leave? Um, yeah. and, and then it spews out a whole a whole different conversation. Is it to do with compensation? Is it to do with benefits? Is it to do with the flexibility or lack of flexibility? Is it to do with culture? Is it to do with anything else? And, you know, these are very, very complex issues, but I personally, I don't know, maybe, maybe something is wrong with me, but, but I get excited yeah. about the possibilities. There's definitely a plethora of interest of employees in everywhere, right? It's it's not only yeah. you. I think it's there's a lot of different people who are interested in relating to their jobs for others than just money, or maybe it's just a part of that interest, right? Yeah, but th exactly right. But again, that is just what excites me. That yes, it is hard yeah. work, but just to be able to talk to people who I very different to myself who do very different things to myself in the business and learning from them and and collaborating to try to solve for these complex issues i think there are just so many opportunities there that anyone who embraces that kind of approach is gonna have a fun ride i think you know i'm not saying it's <laughs> going to be easy <laughs> but it's gonna be fun <laughs> Mary, I just well wanna... but still an opportunity Sorry, um, Imran, you were saying. No, no, no. I just want to back Mary up, but with two solid right. statements. I just want to uh, thank you. I'm becoming a fan as well, Mary. Keep saying those <laughs> things. And I'm just going to summarize <laughs> right. to everybody. Talking, you know? and I want, no, 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 Mary. Look, I want to do this. I want everybody to understand what Mary is saying here. Like, first of all, the first thing she touched was complexity theory. What do you do when things get too complex and you can't deal with it? First of all, vulnerability. I got no fucking clue. I don't know how to deal with this, but I need to go and speak to somebody. Now let's apply that to complexity theory. There are three questions you can ask yourself in complexity theory. How do I do it? Yeah. What do I do? And these two are the force questions. You, if you do that, you'll die. The only question you can ask in complex situation is who do I speak to next? Okay, yeah. so that's all of us can learn that now. That's how you deal with complexity. Who do I speak to next? That means all leaders need to go, okay, who do I need to speak to? That's the first thing, that was the first thing. Then he talked about data. I've visited over, I don't know, 600 companies in the last 500 years globally, over a thousand teams. And everybody I meet shows me only three types of data. They show me either um, validating data, how many hours of training have we done? So we validate the current system. So you can't build a system if you're validating the data you've got. The other data they show me is what they um, very often call summative data, sales data. We sold 4 million last month. <laughs> doesn't take you into the future. And the final data they show me is blaming data. That is evaluating data. That is how well does your team lead treat you? So any sort of evaluating data that creates a benchmark will hurt people and break them. 
And what you're saying is we need different types of data. And what are the three types of data that we need? We need number one, learning data. Learning data means that it helps you to understand the today, the present, and you can move forward. Then the other part of data you need is formative data. Formative data is data about how to see the way forward. And the final piece of data you need is generative data. That means you have to ask the right question. And most organizations don't work with those three types of data. Mm. So Mary, everything you said is spot on. I've just summarized it. Now. Well, I, I just want to, I just want to quote my mom here, you know, um, because this, uh, yeah, seriously, I want to quote my mom here and going back to what Iman said as well is, it's not about what you know, but it's about who you know. And then I would take it a step further. What do you do with the knowledge and the experience and their wisdom that they uh, wanted or, or, you know, to, to pass on to you? But if anyone, you know, if anyone thinks that they know it all, no, <laughs> just, no, just no. Mary, um, I've got a talk we could do together. Okay, great. You know, I'm going to call, can, well, can, I, can I name the talk? professional, guys. No, 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 I, but I mean, no, 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 I mean this, I mean this, the talk we could hold together for the world is no genius, no problem. All right, I'm in. <laughs> sounds, sounds like yet another great hacking HR event, you know, building connections and creating spin-offs. This is this is <laughs> awesome. I was just yeah. following the, the chat and um seeing what, what people are saying and reinforcing the, the trust topic and reinforcing, you know, the relationship topic and reinforcing, you know, culture ed versus culture fit and managing for value, not for timesheet. Um, I just got reminded of, of how HRM should move from human resources management into human relationships management and how the HR department, whatever these two initials will end up um, representing is more about mediating and facilitating and enabling relationships to happen rather than just you know being react, uh, reactively recruiting and reactively creating you know training needs shopping lists and mm -hmm. reactively just you know administratively packaging decisions that that are are being made with no visibility for them um not all we, we talked about um, opportunities moving, moving forward and, uh, and I guess Adem has uh, a uh, particularly interesting view on, on opportunities with the, the type of, of visibility you have over the market and, and the challenges. Uh, well, yes. Well, <laughs> uh, but we, we, we see how the market is, uh, is, is let's say turning around in some ways because uh, before it was always okay we need some specific profiles that everybody knew you will not find them not in Luxembourg not in the greater region and for most of them even not in Europe so therefore we, we, we started really um, as you said before the HR has to change I often did the speeches about the talent attraction in Luxembourg and I always ask the, the HRs who were present, um, if you find the true talent, you're hiring him, he's coming to Luxembourg, what is then your major problem? And everybody was sitting there and saying, no idea. Well, the easiest problem is that if he's coming to you and asking where is a supermarket, 89% or 90% of you are not living in Luxembourg, you have no clue how to find something to eat. So, and this is one of the major problems uh, because those people think that, okay, I'm now here, I got a good salary, I have a nice house, uh, my children are in a great school, I have a great healthcare system, but I, didn't get, I don't get in touch with people here because nobody helps me, nobody orientates me so much. And uh, these are one of the major problems that we see and uh, everybody can attract talents, honestly. If you have the money, you have the support, you can attract everything you want. Uh, mm -hmm. But to retain them here mm -hmm. in Luxembourg now, especially for me, this is the major topic, I think, for us. 
And um, if you see the, the, how the world is changing, and even in Luxembourg, uh, 12, 18 months ago, everybody was speaking about high profile, so um, talents, talents in IT, talents in engineering, talents in I don't know what, but people who are working as in a craft sector are also talents. And these are the people that we are missing too. You don't need 20, 20 of the best hackers in the world to run a supermarket, but you need those people who are working there. And these people also are talents, I have talents. And this is honestly the major part of the population what we are not talking about. We are talking about those 10% up there who are in fact for the newspapers and for all the, the I don't know what shows are running businesses. Okay, they're running business, they're earning money, but still without the soldiers, nobody is surviving in this case. And, and that's something really important. And we see it also, as it was mentioned before, the cultural aspect. I also include in my presentation about uh, talent attraction, the uh, Hofstede uh, insights about cultural relations between two countries. And we see it, if uh, we had lots of people coming from Asia to Luxembourg, they integrated well in their companies where only people from China, Korea or whatever were working. But when they once lose their job, they were lost in space. It was kind of, where am I? I have no relation with people in Luxembourg. I only have my company members and you will not get happy again. And this is also a problem. We have a multicultural society in Luxembourg. Honestly, we have more than 150 languages which are spoken, but you don't find it easy to get into this uh, society if you have, don't have any help. And this is one of the things that I think is the most important for the future of HR, not mm -hmm. only take the people or hire them, but also help them to live properly in the country, wherever, Luxembourg, Germany, Belgium, I don't care, but you have to help them to integrate. And this is one of the major facts, not only spend money in, uh, I don't know, trainings that maybe for the first two years are important, but afterwards nobody's speaking about, but do trainings that that are necessary and trainings to integrate people in your company or integrate the company into the country even. This is also a major point, but it's often missing or very often missing, I say. Laurent, okay. this is so important what you're saying. Sorry, I have to say something because I'm an expat <laughs> myself uh, living in London um, for many years now and I don't have much to say about, uh, uh, well, I have, but I will keep it to myself for now, but other than for now to say, Laurent, thanks for bringing this up mm. uh, as, a, as, a, as a really key point, you know? Thanks. Yeah, I, I yeah second, indeed. I, yeah, I second Mary and I second Laurent uh, and everything that, that was said regarding, uh, you know, cultural competence as, as a, um, indicator of the quality of life. And oftentimes in, in many conversations, um, I, I became aware of the need to uh, make a distinction between quality of life and quality of human connection and how these two are, are related to one another and how these two are also related to our sense of belonging. And if we feel this you know, in our personal lives, and with work becoming such a, a defining and such an important part of our life, distinguishing between quality of work and quality of human connections at work is also a topic that, that I'm very happy to see it's been raised more and more frequently lately. And, you know, talking about emotions and talking about belonging and talking about deep human needs and deep human values being normalized or starting to be normalized. Um, I'm, it's I'm almost like it's, yeah. It's almost like I mean, Minola, you 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 have such a way of summarizing, and I just love it. You're such a wordsmith, but it's almost like it's almost like we we need to undo some of what's been done in the corporate world for some years, where you know mm -hmm. the word resilience, for example, was 
shoved down our throats and we were told that resilience means, you know, you show no emotion, you know, you're th this, this tough, you know, I, you know, whatever happens, I can do it. There is no vulnerability, space for vulnerability day. It just made me think about that, how, you know, th those conversations are going and yeah. have been going in a very different direction because of the pandemic, right? Absolutely. A bit mindful of time, and, and this is such an uh, ongoing source of, of positive frustration. The time seemed to fly by so fast. Um, just, to, just to summarize, um, I'm, I'm really happy to see more talk about resilience and psychological safety, um, biting a little bit into the talk about ambition and maybe shaping the talk about you know, what it means to be ambitious within the work environment means and how people um, might have different definitions to ambition. One of the things that I picked up very happily uh, within recent conversations in how people um, unlearn and undo some of the definitions that they had about work growing up and what work meant to them and what they were taught that work means and what they now see as what they can bring into their work and what value they want to take out of their work. And I believe that these conversations will, will continue in, in the future. And that's part of um, this entire repositioning of, of work-life blending, I guess. So Miguel, if, if you, if you want to take away the the last question and then yes. uh, we can we can just wrap it up. Yes, so guys, um, not with any bad intention, but as, as Minola saying, we need to be mindful of time, but we don't want to close this or as open to the Q&A before each one of you tells us really quickly in a concise way and an effective way, what do you think, if you, sorry, if you can please number one actionable step step that you would advise for people to start doing say tomorrow or Monday morning on this matter. And Laurent, let's start with you. Always me. <laughs> um, one thing, um, stay open-minded. Open-minded in, in any way, in the way of learning new things, in the way of learning getting in touch with new people or uh, working on your network and um, stay open to, to really to learn new things in your job because uh, lifelong learning was often said or often everybody was laughing about because nobody knew it would be so important now in our days and those stay open-minded. Stay open-minded. Cora. You're, You're muted, on mute. Cora. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I think I'd just say um, feel comfortable engaging in difficult conversations, mm. uh, whether it be with your colleagues or with your employer. I think that's very important because if you don't know where you stand, if you don't know where, where they stand and what they're expecting from you, uh, change is not going to happen. So I think... Um, we should all start, yes, having, be, being able to have difficult conversations is important. Engage in difficult conversations. By the way, this topic comes up a lot in our hacking HR meetings. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, I'm not, I'm not joking. So let's be mindful of that. Imran. I'm gonna make what Cora says more practical. Um, like, I think the, for me, the, the one thing is about holding space. So when you do start that, when that difficult conversation happens, that you hold space, because that's what you need to do to have a difficult conversation. If you're not able to hold space, you can't have a difficult conversation. Um, the next time somebody faces you and they say something, sexist, racist, ist, ableist, anything like that, then hold your ground and hold your space. And don't go, don't, and don't drive it with passion and don't drive it with your righteousness and your better degree. Drive it with compassion and with empathy. And I try to understand and hold them, but don't let them go. 
-hmm. And you will, it will be hard. Your back will sweat. That little droplet of water will go down and drop between your buttocks. And you will feel it. Um, but when you hold that space um, and you stay, and it might be with a glass of wine in a party, at a friend's house, in the kitchen, and you think, God, I thought you were going to be a nice conversation, but you're turning out to be a real dick. Um, no, hold it. And hold it for the, for the next half an hour and see what happens. Good. Hold your space with empathy. And last but not least is Mary Gluwaka. What will you be? What will your words be? So on a practical level, I would encourage everyone to go back to their workplace tomorrow and reach out to three random people who are outside of your department or your team and invite them for a virtual coffee just to say hi. Some may think you're a bit crazy, but whatever, you know, <laughs> and just do it. You, you, you'll be surprised, you know, what you're going to learn and, and just have a chat with someone that you'd never normally chat to. And on a more philosophical level, I would say keep learning because it really is a privilege. Mm. Um, there are so many people around the world, young, but of any age really, mm. So I'm sorry to say, but would do a lot to have the opportunities that we have had. Um, and learning is a privilege and embrace it and don't be embarrassed that, you know, that we might not know something. It's just part of life. We know very little as I'm going to quote my dad now, because if I quote my mom, <laughs> I have to quote my dad. But uh, we are born stupid and we die stupid. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we're, we're on a journey and we're all work in progress. So these would be the two things for me to the, Great. to all the friends today. Good. So take a coffee, keep learning, stay learning all the time and always include young people. So before giving the floor to Minola, who will be open into questions and answers, she will also give you some words and some summary. I'd like to also call everyone in the conversation. If you feel that you have anything that you'd like to indicate considering what do you think is your point of view of what we should do tomorrow morning to change the situation? Please just include it in the comments. We'll be glad. Remember that Minola always grabs information from this and then she sometimes pours it around on LinkedIn. So thank you, Minola. Yes, thank yours. you. Otherwise, no pressure. Yes. So please feel free to keep me busy in, in the chat. So I'm just <laughs> I'm just going through through your, your key takeaways, Laurent, with stay open-minded, Cora with engage in difficult conversations, then Imran, hold your ground with compassion, and Mary, learning is a privilege, embrace it. So these are great, great takeaways for, for today. Um, we have two more minutes. I will hold the last minute just to tell you about our next event coming up on March the 3rd. But if, if anyone from the audience wants to uh, contribute with their own thoughts, ideas, um, their own war stories going through the pandemic, now is, is the time. So just uh, raise your hand, um, unmute yourself and um, share with us um, something if you feel comfortable doing that, of course. Um, yes. Yes, please, Dennis. Um, we talked about cultural differences and attitudes towards vulnerability. And for certain cultures, that's a huge step and maybe not even uh, a conceivable one. Uh, maybe a, a, a step towards more open communication would be permission to be curious. And curiosity is, is not open vulnerability, but for people from certain cultures, it's a step in the right direction. Mm. Great point there, Dennis. Thank you very, very much. Permission to be curious. Anyone, anyone else um, would like to, to contribute with something else? We are one minute out. So um, thank you very much all for, for today. It was great. Imran, did you want to, to say something? No, 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 no. no. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm um, so our next event will be on March 3rd. And because it's Hacking HR's Global um, Mental Health Awareness Month, um, we will have the event on mental health, well-being, and psychological safety. 
So we are now uh, chasing speakers. If you have any ideas, recommendations, people that had relevant things to say in meaningful ways to say it, then please feel free to connect on LinkedIn. Drop me a uh, drop me a note, and I'm I'm happy to stay connected. I'm happy to follow up on your recommendations. Um, follow us on LinkedIn. Reach out to Miguel. Reach out to myself. Um, we are all fans here of Laurent, Mary, Cora, and and Imran. Thank you so very much. It's been it's been absolutely awesome. Have a lovely, lovely rest of your morning, midday, afternoon, whatever time you are experiencing right now. Hope to welcome you again at Hacking HR Luxembourg and Friends event. So thank you so, so very much. It's been a privilege having you with us. Thanks, Manola and Miguel thank for making you. it possible. Yes, and thank, thank you, Miguel. You always, always a thank pleasure doing business with you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks to you, Minola, as always. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and if the panel can stay for one more minute, if at all possible, that would be great. If if not, then then we will reconnect soon. Thank you, guys. Thank it was you. really good. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, Barbara. Thanks. Thank you for Bye. 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 Bye.